All right, ladies and gents, welcome back to part three of the basic MLB modeling uh, video series. My name is James McCool. I am the person over at pater.ghost.io, I guess owner of the site, whatever you want to call it. Um, I have been a DFS player for a while, and I'm just giving some instructionals on how to build a very basic um, regressional model in MLB. Uh, this is something that I hope people can take and apply to other sports, apply to other situations in life. Um, these kinds of things can be learned and applied to a whole bunch of different situations and circumstances. And uh, I think that most people learning about regression and math and, and some basic formulas can really help people go a long way towards solving other problems outside of DFS. Um, obviously, this is a daily fantasy sports related video. So that's kind of what I am, you know, talking through and referring to when we're going through the examples in this. But I think this kind of stuff can certainly be applied to other parts of uh, just kind of, you know, everyday life. Um, you can do regressional stats, it, like if you're going to be using Excel, that is, right? I mean, you're not going to be using regressional stats or regressional mathematics uh, when you go to the grocery store and buy mushrooms, but uh, you can use it when building up budget sheets. You can use it when trying to project forward on uh, just like, you know, a whole bunch of different things. So it's mostly daily fantasy sports advice, but you can take a lot of these formulas and a lot of this advice and kind of try to apply it to other things. So uh, let us recap a little bit from the first two videos. So the end goal here is that we are trying to build up this matchup sheet here where we are going to be taking in players uh, and a pitcher. So we're going to have two teams, Nationals, Orioles, or whatever, you know, and there, there are only a couple... Um, example teams here. I don't have all 30 whatever teams from the uh, MLB, but the goal here is to take two teams, put them up against each other, and say, here is this pitcher, here is this group of hitters. Let's just put together a very basic projection of what these hitters should be able to accomplish against this pitcher. Um, and, and later on, I think what we're probably going to do is try to put together something that says, what is this pitcher going to do against these hitters. I think that would be something good for the next video or maybe two videos down the line, depending on how much I can get through in this one. So uh, what we have done is we have put together a couple different tabs here. Um, this hitters tab holds all of the hitters in the league uh, and the stats that we want from them. So here are the stats that we have pulled for them. Um, we also have this hitter stats tab, which has all of the hitters in the league, which I'm actually gonna move over here with a basic pull from fan graphs. Uh, you can go back and watch video one, I think, is where we went over that. We also have batting orders right here, which uh, is the batting orders that we pulled from fan graphs as well. These are like, I'm doing air quotes, but you can't see that because this is screencast. But these are quote unquote batting orders where I just pulled the, the hitters with the most batting, uh, with the most plate appearances uh, on each team. We, uh, we also did that from fan graphs, uh, we used an index or no, an import HTML formula to do that. And um, that is something you can go back and look in, I think the last video, video two. Uh, we also have daily pitchers. This is the same thing as batting orders. This is just the pitcher that we chose to be starting for each team. Uh, we have pitchers, which is the same thing as hitters. Um, it just pulled together all of the pitchers in the league and the stats that we care about for this exercise. Uh, and we have pitcher stats, which is all of the pitcher stats for all the qualified pitchers in the league. So those are the things that we pulled in. Um, we also put together some formulas that pull in uh, dynamic hitters and dynamic pitchers from the hitters and pitchers tabs. So that we can put together things like this. Uh, we can type in Astros here, which is another example team. And it'll pull in the Astros pitcher. We can put in Nationals here for the hitters, and it'll pull in the Nationals hitters. So that's where we're at at this point. Um, in this video, we're actually going to start talking a little bit more about regression. We're going to start talking a little bit more about um, the correct way to regress stats in a matchup for the MLB. Um, and the easiest way to think of it, you, you kind of have to think about it in 
a way of what affects what, right? When we talk about regression, we're not necessarily talking about, uh, oh, this player is going to get worse. That's a pretty common misconception. Um, regression goes both ways, right? Like you can have a player that is doing very well and will regress towards their mean. You can have a player that's doing very badly and regress towards their mean. Um, a lot of people misuse the term regression and use positive regression or negative regression. Um, regression is just regression. It's, it's regression to the mean. So uh, when you are thinking about a hitter in a vacuum, what they are regressing to would be their averages, their mean. Uh, if a player has a, a, a mean batting average of like 335, like a batting average 335, and they've been batting like 200 for the last three weeks or something like that, we expect them to get better unless there is an extenuating circumstance. We expect if all of the variables are the same, for the most part, that they are going to regress towards their mean. They won't regress up to their mean, but they will regress towards their mean. Uh, meaning that if a hitter prob if a hitter comes into a season having a 335 batting average, which is ridiculous, but let's just use it for arbitrary example, and they bat 230, for the first part of the year, it doesn't mean that they are going to end the year with a 335 batting average. It means that we expect them to get closer to the 335 batting average that we projected for them um, in increments and chunks that happen at a random distribution across the timeline. Uh, we would probably expect if you put somebody out there and said, okay, they are going to have a 335 batting average by the end of the year, they've done it three years straight. And then they start the year, the first uh, fifth of the year, right? They only bat 200. Then you don't realistically expect them to end with 335 because they would have to bat like 380 through the rest of the year in order to reach 335. You probably expect them now. You would have to continue to, to push down their end of season projection based on every game that they go into with the 200 batting average. So the farther that you go from the beginning to the end of the season, the more likely it is that the batting average that they are currently at will be the batting average at the end of the season. So if you go a quarter of the season with a 200 batting average, then you would expect them to continue, they will regress towards their mean, but even if they bat 335 through the end of the year, they're probably only gonna end up batting 310 or 305. You would expect them to have an, a worse end projection because the beginning of the projection was so bad. And that can happen at any point in the timeline, right? If a batter starts out hitting their average of 335 for the first quarter of the season, and then has a quarter of the season where they bat 200, and then for the rest of the season they again bat 335, then obviously their batting average at the end of the year is not 335, even though they were hitting at 335 for a majority of the season. So when somebody is hitting 200 and they should be hitting 335, we expect them to regress towards their mean, but we should not expect them to end with their mean. We should continue to be dynamic in the way that we are projecting forward. So that's kind of a basic idea of, of what regression means in a vacuum, but we aren't really looking at this in a vacuum, right? We're looking at this with another variable added. If no variables are added, then Mr. 335 should probably end up batting 335 for the majority of the time, even if he doesn't finish with a 335 average. He will finish with a new average, and that's what we would regress to after that. Um, or, or during, like during a dynamic timeline. But if we have an extenuating circumstance, uh, then we should be regressing towards that. Um, home run for fly ball is something that is important to regress, and a lot of people don't because you have to regress that to league averages um, with, a, with a little bit of a push up based on a player's actual rate. Um, Pete Alonso is going to have a higher high home run per fly ball average than the rest of the league, but he's not going to average a 30% home run per fly ball rate. Um, if league average is 14%, he might be 18, maybe 19%, but he's not gonna be 30%. So you do have to regress that back down towards a league average. If the vast majority of people are doing something based on the circumstances around them, then yeah, there are going to be people that are better or worse, but for the most part, it's probably going to end up somewhere around league average. Um, 
those exceptions to the rules are not generally super large exceptions in something with such a, with such a large sample size. So then, after those two examples, first we have one in a vacuum, and then we have one where we're regressing the league average. And the third one that I think is important is regressing to pitcher averages. So you'll notice that I'm talking a lot about hitter regression here, and not necessarily pitcher regression. And I think that, for me, my idea of regression for MLB is much more predicated on the pitcher's stats and capacities rather than the hitters. I think the hitters, as, as a general rule in every sport, being um, proactive rather than reactive, I think that the one that can be proactive is always going to have the advantage and should always be the one that we are predicating off of. The, for instance, in the NFL, um, defense is predicated by offense, not the other way around. You don't regress an offense based on how good a defense is. You regress a defense based on how good an offense is because an offense has the opportunity to be proactive, whether, whereas defenses have to be reactive. In the same way for baseball, um, you don't regress pitchers very much based on their opponent, based on the hitters they're going to face, you address the hitters based on the way that the pitcher is able to play. You don't necessarily get worried about Garrett Cole going up against, um, you know, the, the Nationals, because the Nationals still have to react to the way that Garrett Cole pitches. You don't necessarily, re you don't necessarily drop Max Scherzer up against the Astros, because the Astros still have to react to a very, very good and very, very violently aggressive pitcher. So most, if not all of the things that I do, I regress pitchers a little bit to hitters, not near as much. I usually do about a 15% a uh, regression for pitchers based on the hitting matchup. But for hitters, I usually regress almost 50%, sometimes 60%, because I do think that it is vastly, vastly, vastly more important to consider the pitcher's efficiencies rather than the hitter's efficiencies. So let's take a look a little bit at this. I wanted to go into that and really kind of explain the um, the basics of regression and, and the things that I do. Um, we are going to show a slight example of regression here uh, and then probably continue it onto the next video so this one doesn't become like a half hour long video. So. Let's, let's just take a look at this really quick. Um, we're we're going to pull Justin Verlander's stats. So we'll say Justin Verlander here, right? And we're going to put him up against uh, Juan Soto. So this is a pretty fun matchup, obviously. And, and what we are looking at here is this. So this is strikeout per plate appearance, batting average, walk per plate appearance, um, stolen base per plate appearance, home run per plate appearance, single per plate appearance, and double per plate appearance. Oh, and this actually needs to go right here. Okay, so we're going to use an index formula here really quick. An index match match. We're going to go look into pitchers. where we are going to highlight the entire thing, and I'm not going to really talk too much about how to do these formulas. I, I've explained the index match match in the uh, last two videos, so I'm probably just going to go through this, and if you'd like to get a little bit of a uh, breakdown on how to use an index match match formula, then uh, go back and watch the other videos if you haven't. Let's see, and then we're going to... Is that in pictures? Yeah. Screw it. I'm not going to go all the way down that. So that is matching the pitcher, that is choosing the row that I want to look into. So my keyboard just doesn't work when I do videos. Mm 
and that is choosing the column that I want to look into. So then that should give me the strikeout rate for Justin Verlander. And then if I just copy this across, right, fuck something up. There it is. There we go. All right, and then I'm actually just going to copy this because I know that I used the same stuff, but now all I need to do is look in hitters. I can do that. There's that. There's that. There's that. And that should give me the strikeout for plate appearance for Juan Soto, but maybe it didn't. Why would that have not worked? It's really gonna make me write this out. Oh, no it's not. It's because I'm an asshole. There you go. All right. Copy that across, I'm getting everything there. All right, so then these are all these are all averages or all percentiles. So do that. All right, so we have our matchup set up here, um, where we're just saying here's Justin Verlander against Juan Soto, and now the basic thought here is that I, I think that what a lot of people do is just kind of average things out, right? Where you just say equals average of these things. And this obviously is not the just like thing that most people do. This is a very basic idea, right? Like if you average these things out, then what we would expect for, let's say, uh, this is Verlander projection. And we will also say Soto projection. So we're going to have two different sets of projections. Right, so this is both of these guys put up against each other if we are just doing a very basic averaged out thing. Now, obviously, this isn't what is actually going to happen. Um, if you average things out, then what you end up getting is something that is right in the middle, and that's fine. Um, that can give you like an idea of, uh, you know, something that is an acceptable range of things that is gonna happen, but it's probably not gonna be the actual thing that happens. We really don't expect both of these guys in a matchup of a million times to end up with Verlander having a 27% strikeout rate and Soto have a 27% strikeout rate. Um, that's not really realistic. We expect the pitcher to have the upper hand in most situations. So um, what we need to do is we need to say, okay, what do we want to regress for Verlander, right? What do we want to regress for Juan Soto? Uh, my idea here is that we're going to give a 15% reduction or a 15% regression to Verlander based on his matchup. And then I'm going to give a 50% regression to Juan Soto based on his matchup. So instead of just averaging this, what we need to do is we need to say, okay, uh, what is Justin Verlander's normal strikeout rate? And then what do we expect it to be if he faces Juan Soto and we regress it based on Juan Soto's stats? And the same thing with uh, Juan Soto, like what do we expect his strikeout rate to be if he faces Justin Verlander based on a 50% regression? So what we're actually going to do here is we're going to say we're going to take their regular average, which is 35 for Justin Verlander, and then we're going to say plus the a 15% difference between these two things. So plus this minus this. So plus Verlander minus Juan Soto's strikeout rate. And that's the first part of it. And then 
times 0.15. And actually, we want it to be the matchup first, so 15 and 14. So that would be a 15% regression based on Juan Soto's stats. If we push this up instead of 15 and we do 50, then we end up with their average. See how that works? When you are averaging something, you're doing a 50% regression. If you are taking a pitcher stats and doing only a 15% regression, then you expect it to drop 15% of the difference between Verlander and Juan Soto. And we can do the same thing. We can take this formula and we can just flip it around, right? Um, we can paste it here and we can say instead of B14, because that's just in Verlanders, we can say B15. And we're going to do the opponent minus the average that we worry about. And since I said I wanted that to be a 50% reduction, then we expect that to be a 27% strikeout rate for Juan Soto. We expect Verlander to have a 33% strikeout rate in this matchup, Juan Soto to strike out 27% of the time. In terms of an actual projection. And we can do that across all of these things, right? We can say, um, why is the batting average for Justin? Oh, yeah, that, that actually makes sense. So these two are not this, right? They are, what are you doing here? Why? Whatever, okay. Uh, 172 average and 283 average. So we're, we're going to expect those things to converge a bit. Um, Jerson Verlander would allow a 188 batting average to Juan Soto, and Juan Soto would bat 222.7 against Jerson Verlander. Uh, we can go over to walks, we can go over to home runs, we can go over to singles, and we can go over to doubles. Um, note that Justin Verlander and Juan Soto both have home run plate appearances of pretty even rates, so that actually ends up being pretty close. Um, singles ends up being pretty close, doubles ends up being pretty close, and the reason for that is because pitchers and hitters aren't necessarily completely in control of those things when they happen, they are regressed based on other things. But strikeout plate appearance is a very own stat between the players, we see large differentials there. Batting average, we see large differentials there. Walks, we see a pretty large differential there. So that is the basics to regressing based on another variable. Uh, if you are going to be trying to regress somebody's strikeout plate appearance based on their matchup, uh, decide how much you would like to regress them by, um, and then set that up in this same formula where you are taking the player's stat, you are adding the difference between the opponent's stat and that player's stat times whatever you want to regress by, and that's a base regression formula. So in the next video, we're going to end up regressing all of these stats, and we're going to build a basic projection for Justin Verlander against the Nationals or whatever team against whatever team. Um, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching the videos and giving me something to do. Hopefully, I can get the next one out before the end of the week, and uh, definitely come join the Discord. Come join the community if you haven't already over at paydirt.ghost.io. Thanks for tuning in.